Welcome to season two, episode eight of Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us today and choosing that path to grow personally and professionally. And I would like to encourage and thank everyone for being here, but to turn on your camera if, you, if available and to listen intently. The Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program at USF develops students three main ways. One, to empower them to build and develop their own company, the traditional way we view of entrepreneurship. But entrepreneurship has expanded, and now entrepreneurship and its mindset and its processes are embedded in companies known as corporate innovators or corporate innovation. And students are empowered to work for Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, HP, or other leading companies that innovate. And I have more than 15 students that I've taught over the years working at these famous companies. And lastly, we empower students to develop and divine careers that they create themselves. Go out and create jobs and a career path that isn't even created, that you imagine. And step by step, create that life that you want, not what for you, like other majors. And our next guest has a very unique history that will help us understand ourselves, what's possible, and to build some certain skills along the way, okay, much like we're doing this every week on The Open Educator. Our next guest is someone who's a role model of lifelong learning, an important topic we continue to talk about weekly. His learning has taken him to different countries, different careers, different industries over his lifetime. Having known him for many years, I look up to him as a compassionate leader, someone who's committed to his craft of leadership and anything that he sets his mind to. He's a lifelong or many year or long time toasty or to toastmaster. Kudos and shout out to downtown Toastmasters. In fact, he is a distinguished Toastmaster, which is the highest achievement one can achieve within the 100 year old club of the Toastmasters in public speaking. And our next guest will be sharing a micro workshop on how to command your audience and expand the digital box or the box that we find ourselves in. Please give a warm welcome to Ken Reed. I'm going to turn the Zoom floor over to Ken now. Please pay attention and focus on the Ken Square. Thanks very much, Steve, for that warm introduction and uh, no pressure. I, you should be looking at a blank screen right now, and, and that's on purpose. You're not experiencing any technical difficulties, and right now, neither am I. But I wanted to share just some thoughts I have because of the ex common experience we've had over the last year in our Zoom environment. And I think it's kind of important that we understand that how Zoom presents us limits how we communicate with people. One of the most important components of speaking with people is nonverbal communication. And when we sit here and we are focused just as a talking head, there's a lot of things that we miss. And I wanna talk about ways that you can expand that stage and make yourself a better communicator. So I'm gonna talk about two things. One of those is the box that presents, that we're presented by in, in the Zoom environment. And the other thing I wanna talk about is unspoken premises. Now, an unspoken premise is one of these things that forces you to a certain path of logic, but it's not known to you. So one of my favorite jokes goes like this, and it's the way that guys get their guy friends in trouble. And it's this joke. Does your wife know that your girlfriend is pregnant? Now, what are the unspoken premises there? One, you're married. Two, you have a girlfriend your wife doesn't know about. And three, she's pregnant. But the real unspoken premise is the way the question is constructed to a yes or no answer. And that yes or no answer will not be a right answer, which is the embarrassment to your friends. And it's those unspoken premises that occur. 
Now, you've seen some pictures of me, so you have some impression, but my goal right now with not having a picture right now uh, is just to go ahead and show myself. You listen to my voice. You have some contacts with my authority, with my voice alone, and that's my verbal communication with you. But let's take, for example, if this was your first impression of me. And you just assume I'm just some old guy who has no idea what he's doing with Zoom and I'm just trying to communicate with people the best I can. And of course, I'm so close, you can't really see me. And if I made gestures, you couldn't see those either. Or there's the person who makes the casual Zoom view and you're thinking they just don't care about being there. So if they don't care, why should I? Or there's somebody who tries to make some attempt to give a little space and gesticulate so they stand up like this and they're doing their best but then yeah it's not a very flattering view and unfortunately you're probably getting two more chins that i want you to see but that's the unspoken premises of the way we control this environment now how can we beat this well with any chain the most important thing is the anchor and how we get anchored to our Zoom environment really has to do with the distance away. So we start off with our workspace. If you're in front of a laptop computer or you're on a desktop computer, then you are stuck because you want to be close to where you can type on the computer or interact with it somehow. So my goal is to give you some quick tips on how to break away from some of those chains. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm just going to cover a few. Now, one of the ones... The, the cheapest trick I can think of, especially if you're on a laptop, is this. This is the humble music stand. I'm sure you've seen these. I caught this. I bought this for twenty-five dollars. I actually use it when I speak uh, professionally away, so that I can just take it with me and have a workspace. Now, what does this do? Uh, you can see that the angle that I have right now is just about chin high to me. And that gives you a nice framing and a nice view. If you look at Steve's frame, he's framed up the same way. And I happen to know that he's using a tablet and a tripod to give you this great framing. So this gives me the opportunity to set up a great camera angle, but I'm still tied down to the keyboard, which is okay though, right? Because I can get a nice angle. But let's say, for example, you're tied down to your uh, laptop computer or your desktop computer, then perhaps and there's another small little tripod here that allows you to move this wherever you want. Now the perception is, is that I'm looking here, but I could have the laptop in my lap and I could communicate with everybody. I could give this great angle uh, curated the way I want it but I can still communicate without looking ridiculous. So I'm gonna show you my setup in my home. I have a place that looks, uh, it's my, I call it my pundit corner. And I have a tripod here, right here. I have a little desk. I have a wireless keyboard that connects into my, my tablet. And then I have some auxiliary lighting over here and the lighting is just so I can control it. So day or night, I have the consistent lighting. So that's just when I show a little, a little bit to you how you can take the Zoom environment and, and not just be in the box, but curate it so you have more authority, you're comfortable, you can use the devices you need to make it a good communication with the people you're working with, and you can look professional at the same time. Thank you very much for that time on, on doing this micro workshop. I, this really is about a 30 minute thing that I do with people. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you and Steve, what else can I give you? <laughs> Ken, thank you for that micro workshop. I know we've worked together in our MBA course. We teach a, uh, uh, he's a visiting guest when we teach a, a thematic approach about listening and commanding an audience. It's this improv for business course. So thank you for that micro workshop to realize these are small things that really don't cost a lot that can help us expand our digital box that we find ourselves in because we're going to have to communicate. 
verbally, non-verbally, and use all the tools that we're going to need and land a job, communicate our ideas, pitch, raise funds, get hired, manage people, manage projects. And I would argue that this becomes even more important in today's environment than just even one year ago. So this is a small taste. Of course, this is something that you practice. This is something that you have to take a step and leap of outside of your comfort zone and box. So thank you for that. Ken, I've known you for years and I know you have a plethora of experiences, but one thing, let's start off with this. Um, in the little poster that Sienna sent out, there was three interesting photos. Maybe you can walk us through about what happened in those photos or how they represent parts of your career and life? Sure. I'm going to start with the photos and focus on those a little bit for you. Uh, you'll see one picture where I'm wearing a big red Michelin man suit. And one of my career paths, and I've had a few, we'll talk about those later on, was I ran an international security program for an embassy in the Netherlands. And one of the absolute joys I had is they allowed me to pretend to be an intruder into the building and then we had a detachment of Marines who would then run me down and capture me or arrest me or kill me if need be that was part of the game and so I put this big suit on so these guys could swing on me full force if they wanted to and that was just the way that I was able to create a, a very realistic training environment for those Marines and it was an absolute joy when I could defeat them, which didn't happen very often, but sometimes I could trick them into a situation uh, where I was, uh, but that was good too, because exposed to a security weakness in the building and that, that got corrected. So that was an absolute joy. The other one, uh, who just by uh, thumbs up, who has is familiar with the Nigerian Prince scheme? Nope. Okay, so the Nigerian prince, okay, thanks. The, for those who don't know, uh, if you've gotten some email in the past that looked kind of shady, that my name is so-and-so, I'm living in a foreign country, uh, I need some help getting $5 million worth of gold into your country, and I have complete discretion over this, uh, these, this asset, if you can just send me $2,000 to cover the paperwork, I'll get it to you. So if you've not heard of that or just look it up online, there is an additional layer to that. It turns out that sometimes these guys actually travel to a foreign country, in this case, the Netherlands, with a bag of money to show these people that it's real. So it's show money. And so these guys showed up at the Dutch airport, Schiphol airport, and they had these Pelican cases full of, of money that you saw in the picture. And that was to show the people that they were working with or conning that it was real. They would just flip it open and close it. Well, the Dutch police caught them. And the Dutch police could not hold them. So they confiscated the bags and then sent the guys back to wherever they were from. However, they didn't know what to do with this American money. So they brought it over to the embassy, and my boss didn't know what to do with it, so he put it in my office instead of his. So that sat there until I could finally just shred all the money. And I had to – and I will tell you a funny story, too. Um, uh, years later, I started dating this lady in Paris who was a Secret Service agent who is now my wife, and she is incredibly angry with me to this day because counterfeit money falls under the purview of the Secret Service. And I didn't report it to her. And I just, you know, my boss didn't know. So why would I? But I'm telling you right now, that's the things that we fight about in my house on a cold winter evening. Wonderful. On top of those career uh, experiences and, and, and examples, I also know that um, you made the most of a trend that was happening in Europe. So just to give a little background about uh, my students and the projects, we're often expected to do research and understand different if that's uh, political trends, um, governmental trends, legal trends, um, 
uh, uh, spending, whatever the case may be. And I know at a time um, in, in the history, there was deregulation going on in the telecom industry. And maybe you could share a bit about how you started or your experience developing and scaling a telecom in another country or several countries, in fact. Sure. I, you know, that was one of the most ex amazing experiences of my life. If we're talking about entrepreneurship and innovation, a lot of times innovation is not just found in technology. A lot of times innovation is found in any element of change. And what happened to me is I was living in the Netherlands back in, I got there in 1990, but I was uh, working as a consultant in 93, 94. And I met these two guys, and one of the guy's brother was involved with the deregulation of the telecom industry in Ireland. I know this sounds complicated. But what that basically was, was allowing competitors to come into a monopoly marketplace. And they were trying to do it in a way that the competitors would not be crushed by the monopoly and would be able to start the businesses on an equal footing, which was key to getting that competition going. Two years after that, the Dutch market started to deregulate also. So my buddy decided he wanted to do that. So to jump back 10 years very quickly, I was a telecoms officer in the army and I had my own phone company in South Korea where I was stationed. So I knew everything about running a telecom company. And in the Netherlands, when our business started, everybody who knew about telecom worked for the monopoly player and it was a cradle to grave career with all the benefits of being a civil servant. And nobody was going to take a risk on the start of business. So I was the perfect guy in the perfect place at the perfect time to start that. And all I had to do was get the operation up and running, handle installations for customers and manage the network. And then I ended up gaining expertise in billing. And then my two business partners handled all the rest. So that was that little tweak that occurred. And now, by the way, our, our market was not going to deregulate for two years after we started the business. But so we were on this gray area of opportunity where the more established competitors like British Telecom would not come into the marketplace because it was illegal. But having a small group like ours start to do that was perfect because we knew that if they took us to court, it would take them two or three years to go to trial. And by then it was legal. So nobody was ever going to take that risk. We could operate in that gray, small market. And that was just an amazing experience. Uh, I went to Barcelona three years after that because that marketplace started to deregulate in the same way as the Netherlands. But by then, I knew everything, all the vendors, all the suppliers, all the technologies. And I could just overlay the business from the Netherlands to Spain and Barcelona specifically. And we were up and running in a month. So what's interesting, I would like to highlight is, as this bigger trend was happening to create more competition in the market, Ken and his partners, because as he mentioned, each one had a very different skill in terms of expertise, were able to exploit and create new businesses uh, in these different countries to you know, create value for their startup uh, in, a, in a changing environment. Because back then, it was very expensive and maybe Dirk would also like to share to even call from one country to the next. And now that's not necessarily the case, but um, that was something that was changing for the customer, customer or consumer and make it cheaper uh, for them to, as the Europe was uh, consolidating or having a, a more of a common union across borders, which is a relatively new thing over, over time in history. So it sounds like you've had these wonderful experiences, but was there any failures and what did you learn from these failures as a process? Maybe you could share a bit about these highs and lows. Absolutely. I was a millionaire by the age of 41 years old. And I was doing this entrepreneurship. I was starting the business in the Netherlands. I did my telecom business in Barcelona and we got bought out by an Italian company, but I didn't want to move to Italy because my family had just joined me in Spain. So I found another business, uh, another buddy of mine from INSEAD, Steve, uh, he was starting a telecom business and he needed an operations director. So I jumped and 
helped him get started with that. And the internet bubble, which was uh, the primary market that burst, was of course supported by the telecom market. And when all the money that was going to internet businesses and then the supporting infrastructure businesses collapsed, I went from a millionaire at the age of 41 to a zero heir at the age of 42 years old. And it was devastating. I'll be honest about that. It was not an easy thing to go through. And I took a year off, about a year and a half off, just to take a break. My family and I went back to the Netherlands where my wife was from. Uh, she was able to get a job immediately. I will tell you, I've spent 20, 25 years of my life as an immigrant and finding a job in a, in a host country is not easy. Even regardless of your background and your experience set, uh, there is a bias toward hiring local, which is completely understandable, right? But it was not easy. I took a break. I, I was a stay-at-home dad for a while. And that kind of put me in touch with something that was important. And it was that idea of being mindful about being in the present, because working those 60 and 80 hour work weeks for the eight years that I did that took time away from my family. Uh, my wife was patient. Uh, you know, she benefited economically, but our, our relationship took a hit, of course. Um, you know, but having that year to kind of recover myself because I'm sure I was clinically depressed back then but just to get my feet back under me and start doing my recreational things that I'd like to do but I had no time for in the past and spending time with my kids was was a plus I mean it was a down time for me but it was an opportunity to rebuild those relationships and just find out who Ken Reed was again instead of Ken Reed the, the entrepreneur drone um which speaks to you all if you do go into the entrepreneur career path, you have to have that work balance. And part of that is finding people you trust that can do things for you and with you. Uh, and that's a big deal. Those, those emotional quotients are a real skill to develop because uh, otherwise you're, you'll, you'll lose your emotional quotient at home. So you really have to maintain that balance as best you can. I would like to prime our guests because I think we've talked a lot and maybe there's opportunities for you to unpack or help ask a question that could clarify because we're talking about a couple of industries, a couple of job careers over his time, and maybe you have something that is, sparks your interest that you would like to know a bit more. So I'm priming our audience. I'll ask another question and then open the, the floor for Q&A if, if anything comes up. Can you, you've talked about, you know, the telecoms from the different countries that you attended, the highs and lows, uh, building trust, building, even regrounding yourself. Uh, if there was a big challenge that you faced trying to grow your business, what would that be? And what advice would you have for others? And of course, every business is different, but would there be a, a challenge that you faced that, that stood out and how did you overcome that? There, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about two of them. Um, the, the first one I want to talk about is the fact that when you're living in the U.S., I think a lot of people seek that entrepreneurial experience and they're willing to take a cut in pay or a cut in something in order to grow their experience set or potentially benefit financially from the entrepreneur situation. In Europe, people are so conservative that they're not willing always to jump in and, and take that risk. And that was also true with our investors. It was very difficult to get investors who had invested in uh, designer gene companies or salt mines or um, uh, car part manufacturing, because that was what our, one of our investors, that's all they did. It was very known markets. It was known business models. It was known quantities. But being a startup business in Europe back in the um, late 90s was hard to find investors. 
and it was hard to find people who would really, so it was, it had to do a lot with the risk. The other thing that was important for me, I didn't know that because again, I was the operations guy and I had to pick this stuff up on the fly. I tell people I'm an entrepreneur by accident, but one of the most key things I learned is if you are an entrepreneur, the most important thing you can do in the first few years of your business is to create business value. So if you take $50,000 and invest it in your company, that's the baseline. Your company is worth $50,000. It's going to be your product development. It's going to be your turnover. It's going to be your place in the market that then creates that value. So when we started the Dutch company that eventually went uh, to the NASDAQ as Versatel, I put $5,000 in and I owned uh, 10% of the company, right? Because it was worth $50,000 when we put all our money into it. By getting revenue and getting customers online and showing that the business model was viable, when we went for investment a year later on, we could show on paper that our company was worth a million dollars. So then when we asked an investor for a couple hundred thousand dollars, he wasn't getting the entire company. He was only going to get 20%. So if we wanted more money, we would give him a higher percentage. And I think in the end, he took 35% of the company. That was our first round of outside investment. The next thing was to build a bit more. After three years, we could show on paper that we were worth $5 million. And then the next investor that comes in gives us more money for a smaller percentage of the business. So it's that value creation that was so key. You can have the best idea in the world, but if you need outside investors, you need to prove the, the worth of the company, hard numbers, not just that it's a smart idea. You have to show that value is there and you have to build it as quickly as you can just to secure one investment and two market pl uh, your place in the market. So what I like that you shared is this idea of value creation. This is an important topic that we talk about throughout the entrepreneurship program and the different courses. What I also hear, and I'm not sure if everyone makes this connection, this is telling a story, a story of value creation, a story of how they enroll new clients, new customers, revenue, and let the data speak for a broader story of why this company is worth more and or to give less ownership to the next investor. So great example, um, even data or numbers can be seen as a form of a story, particularly how you share it with investors if you're looking to raise capital. And this notion that of conservative investors, I'm, we will eventually have another guest on our open educator who's tried to raise funds here in Florida, and she's echoed some of the similar uh, perspectives of investors here in Florida of being conservative because of some of the nature of the people here locally. So thank you for sharing that and how to de-risk or to retell the story or use a data to create value or, or demonstrate value. I would like to open the floor to our audience if we have questions for Ken, because I would also like to ask a couple uh, specific questions about um, some skills that he's been learning and how they've helped him over time. So let's open the floor. Sienna, if there's anyone has their digital hand raised or would like to ask Ken a question? Um, I know we've covered a lot, but. Piero. Hi, Ken. Uh, I would like to ask you, how did you act towards bureaucracy while creating the telecom business? So in my Dutch company, it just so happened <laughs> that one of my business partners was the go-to expert on telecom law in all of Europe. So in that way, uh, which made it easier for us to understand what the risks were, he was the kind of guy, so again, the EU was just kind of coming up. The uh, Euro was not really in place. When I moved to Spain in the late 90s, pesetas was still a thing, you know, and um, so the, the uh, euro was just coming up. The EU was just kind of getting ground. But having this guy who knew all this stuff, and not only did he know the current law, but he knew the direction that the European telecom policies were going to go 
and then the laws that would be supporting those policies. So that was amazing. Now, based on that experience I had when I went to Spain, Spain was starting to, to develop their own legal structure for supporting the new competition coming in. But you have to remember that the Spanish parliament was relying on their only experts, and that was from Telefonica, okay? So this is not a disinterested party assisting with policy. This was a company that wanted to give the perception of assistance, but also lay down some barriers. And I was very, very lucky because the, Dutch, sorry, the Spanish government put a notice out asking people to contribute. And I was able to then say, okay, you have an A license, which is a full-blown competitor to Telefonica. A B license would be services, for example, teleconferencing platforms. Uh, a C license was something else I can't think of. But there was the structure set up. But then for businesses like mine, there was no license. So I was able then to tell the regulators, and I'm very proud of this, and my name is not in a newspaper article or any place, so you have to take my word for this, but I was able to give this input to the regulators in a way that the speed bumps that were be discovered two or three years down the road did not exist for my company or other incoming telecom service companies. And it's just being aware of that, those opportunities and seeing them occur in other countries and realizing that the occurrence could not occur in Spain because of the lack of licensing. You couldn't do the job without the license. Thank you. This is a great example of identifying patterns and trying to capitalize or insert some knowledge and influence that you can exploit at, or capitalizing and create value. Wonderful. What other questions might the audience have? Uh, Ethan. Yeah, hi, Ken. So I was wondering, um, how did you get started on your career path? And were there any experiences in particular that shaped your trajectory? Well, you heard that you that I mentioned I was an accidental entrepreneur. Uh, my life has been a series of, of unfortunate incidents, and I've been so lucky with the way it turned out that I didn't hurt myself or anybody else. I studied radio and television broadcasting in college, and I did that specifically because I was on an ROTC scholarship to go into the Army, so the Army paid my way through school, and I signed my contract because there was a career path at that time for officers to do production work for the military. You've, you've seen these things on television where the film crew and army you know, clothes are out there doing something, and that was what I was going for. So in 1979, the year after I signed my contract for ROTC, they deleted that career path for officers. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, my plans to go into television and film production just went away. There was just no way to recover from that. When I graduated, the Army, in its wisdom, saw that I had the word communications in my diploma. And they thought, okay, that's close enough, telecommunications. Well, I had no idea what that was. And for if you don't know, I mean, you pick up your, your cell phone or your phone at your house, and that's telecommunications to you. But it's the radio connections, microwave connections, satellite connections, fiber optics, it's the switching systems. It's all these things that I now know about, but I had no clue going into the Army. And it was just a big learning curve. And, uh, but one thing about the military in the U.S. is they assume everybody come in, coming in knows nothing. And they're going to just give you that kind of training just to bring you up to speed. Uh, and then I went to, um, when I got out of the Army, my first job was working for a French telecom company in the Netherlands, uh, Alcatel, which was a, an equipment provider. And then the, uh, the telecom business part kicked in, and then the, um, uh, you know, again, Zero Air 42, that kicked in. And because of my military background, I got a job running the security contract at the embassy. Uh, I was an American. Uh, hired as a local guy in the Netherlands who spoke perfect English. I could get a security clearance. So all these things you couldn't get from a regular Dutch guy, they could get from me. And that was an opportunity of the skills that I had 
uh, from the military in the 80s that I could apply to a security, international security career in Europe. And by the way, if you perceive anything about the lighting or the camera work here or my sound device here that you can hear me no matter where I am, it's because I have a background in radio and television broadcasting from Mississippi State University. So knowledge is recyclable. Thank you. Great. Any other questions from the audience? Dirk, you can go first. Hi, Ken. Uh, my name is Dirk Liebeis. I'm a, I'm a colleague of Steve. Uh, I'm an associate professor of entrepreneurship. And we are always looking for ways to improve our program, uh, undergraduate program and graduate program in entrepreneurship. So what do you think are the skills uh, that uh, entrepreneurs need to have? We, we impart like the domain the expertise, like business models and marketing and all that stuff. But that, and that's good, you, you need to have that, but what soft skills and, you know, uh, are things that you that are hard to teach in a, maybe a university context, you know, should students actually have? So I'm going to go with three things. The first one is, and I call this seeking the gap. Where do you find that opportunity? Now, the opportunity for me with the telecom companies was actually a deregulation of the marketplace. Uh, when I lived in the Netherlands in the 2000 knots, they deregulated the electrical market, and you could have done the exact same business model with the exact same skills I had to start an electrical company because it wasn't required that you own the infrastructure. You just build people, and then you marketed the building, and that was, that was all there was to it. So it's recognizing that gap. My favorite example of recognizing the gap has to do with Bluetooth. Bluetooth exists because somebody recognized that there needed to be a reliable, low power radio communication between a device and a device and then some hardware. Mm -hmm. They realized that that did not exist yet. And one of the technical challenges was finding a frequency band they could work on. Well, in Europe and the U.S., there's a, something called the ISM band of frequencies, and those are throwaways. Those are something you don't have to get a license for as long as you're below a certain power output. And that is so they don't manage it. So if you have a device and the device doesn't bleed over to other frequencies, you can make a Bluetooth thing. It has to be certified, but you can make one. But the Bluetooth guys also set up the encryption, the handshaking for the devices, and the everything there was about it. These these guys, I think it was, uh, I want to say Norway or Sweden, I forget now. Mm -hmm. But it was this great idea of, of developing a technology, proving that it worked, creating some early equipment. But then they just got out of the equipment production and just sold licenses. So every time you see Bluetooth on something, these guys are getting a nickel. And I think they're doing pretty good. So that's that's one thing they're doing. The other thing is all the skills you use in business school, you need to apply them from day one in your business. And that was one thing that set our little telecom business apart because I had all this experience in the military with personnel, logistics, systems, mm -hmm. maintenance. And I had my, my partners thought I was nuts because I had SOPs for everything. But what happened, and by the way, we started off with five people, and I had a 200-man org chart. And I did that because I didn't have to reorganize my business every time I hired somebody. All I had to do was build up a little team, and then the capacity required a second little team for installations. Capacity requirements required a third little team. I didn't have to restructure my business every time we grew. My, my company was able to grow organically without disruption. The other thing that's important is I see a lot of entrepreneurs who are compelling people. I see them interviewed and they say things like, well, we hire people who are able to work in a dynamic environment and they don't know what's going to happen day in and day out. And we just make things go. 
And what that tells me is you don't know how to organize a business and you, you may be compelling and can get money, but you're a risk. And uh, the um, Theranos people, that young woman from there is a perfect example of a compelling person who became a billionaire with a nonprofit, not non-profitable business who ended up just being a liar and, you know, a, a total fraud. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just be aware of that red flag. If you're involved with the entrepreneurial group and you understand you're going into this thing with a certain amount of risk for yourself, but also understand that, you know, you're, these things you learn in business school, they work for a reason and you need to have them set up and running because you're going to run into accounting problems with the tax people. You're going to run into regulatory issues on, on the telecom side for me. Uh, you know, all these little things you're learning are valuable. Right. But a, a clever idea does not make it a good business. It has to be something that fits a need that the market has. And maybe they don't know it yet. And then it's small market education. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Hi. So I also have a question. So in our classes, we've learned that, you know, investors would prefer a, a grade A team with a B idea over the opposite, you know, a B team with an A idea. So with that in mind, I know you talked about that you had like a team of five people with a lot of different talents. How did you go about seeking each other? How did you guys find one another? It's about relationships. Uh, we all three met because we were working as consultants in the Dutch market in three different things. Uh, my, my friend who was the telecom law expert was doing that kind of work for the Dutch telecom, the Dutch PTT. He was doing that for some other uh, data vendors that it was already legal to do that in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, and my other business partner was uh, a genius sales and marketing guy, an American guy uh, who came to the Netherlands just on a whim and was able to, to get this business rolling. We could not find uh, your investors. It's about relationship building. It's dating. Okay. When we went for our, our second round of investment, uh, we could not find a local investor. So our first real investor was this millionaire guy from Ireland. And he was the guy who hired my business partner's brother during the deregulation of the uh, Irish marketplace. So it was not a risk to him because he understood it. So that was to our advantage, but we, we knew he would have us over a barrel. So we didn't want him to be our first investor, but once he's the kind of guy that in his country, he would be as well known as Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. And in Ireland, everybody knows this guy. And when he invested a million dollars in us, and then the Dutch people kind of know the guy's name a little bit, that, that broke the barrier of risk to the people. Plus, we could show increasing sales and increasing, uh, you know, everything about turnover increased on our schedule that we were doing. So it was being able to prove that business model. And again, those investors, if, if they... If you have to sell the investor so hard, they're not your investor. Or if you watch the um, Dragon's Den, uh, what is it called here in the U.S.? Um, Shark Tank, right? Okay. Yeah, Shark Tank. If, if you have to sell these guys so hard that you know they say, okay, I'll give you hundred thousand dollars for one hundred percent of your business. Um, wow, you know, is it your business anymore? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> It's it's dating, you know, you know, swipe left if it doesn't work, you know, just. Uh... <laughs> OK, that's a really interesting perspective. Thank you. Ken, one thing that we constantly talk about on the Open Educator and in class is the role of learning, not just learning for an organization or learning for an or entrepreneur or an innovator to exploit the gap or the opportunities like you referenced, but also the role of learning and growing professionally and personally. I know you've taken a few different steps um, in your career to continuously learn. You went to a top 20 business school, a competitor of, of my, my business school. And, and, but more importantly, I also, I know you from Toastmasters. So someone who has all these unique experiences, who've been a millionaire, who's been a hero, 
who's traveled the world, who has these, why go back and learn public speaking or why go to Toastmasters and how has that helped you and what, what have you taken away from this experience? So, barring a traumatic, traumatic head injury, you, you don't lose knowledge. You may forget the details of it, but you, may, you know where to go look for it. And as I mentioned before, my Mississippi State telecommunication, sorry, telephone, tele, radio and television broadcasting thing has made it possible for me to do this. And to be honest with you, I think if I wanted to make extra money, I could make a class on this and put it on YouTube or the internet, and it would be a business opportunity for me. And, but I, I think what happens, and I tell everybody, if you are working someplace, if they ask you what you want out of a job and you say trainings and certifications that will last past your employment, uh, that's high value for you. I find too that the broader that you read and the broader you learn, the more you find out where those gaps exist. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So I, um, this is kind of boring in a way, but let me just, for everything that exists in the world that's technology, there's some working committee someplace. And so I was on this working committee for this technology called MPT 1327, which was a poor man's mobile phone network. Okay. It used, you know, it used push to talk radios and, but it was, you could push to talk, but the infrastructure was there that you could talk to everybody in the country. So that was the whole deal. One of the features of that, specification was being able to send text messages uh, up to 166 characters. And nobody knew what to do with that. What the hell are we going to do? Because, you know, you're sitting on a little keyboard and you gotta, you're using the numbers to do letters and, and it's for people who are driving their vehicles. So what, what are you going to do with that? Well, long story short, Twitter. Right. Who would that same technology existed in mobile phone networks and who would have thought Twitter was a thing? And I know I did. not And it's just one of these things where somebody who maybe had a little bit broader experience or maybe had a different uh, social experience said, hey, you know, this is kind of fun. And and they were able to create this platform that has literally changed the way we consume information and perceive the world. Just to wrap up, one of my favorite questions to ask you, you know, you looking back, if you could go back and share some wisdom with your younger self, what, what advice would you have for him? Well, I think I would give him, you know, it's so hard. I, I've had, I've had my ups and downs. I've learned a lot from the downs. Um, I've, I've traveled extensively. Um, I'm not sure if I put it in my uh, bio, but I've lived overseas for 27 years. Um, my Spanish is passable. My Dutch is fairly fluent. I could count to 10 and be polite in Korean back when that was a necessity. Um, even, even uh, I was gonna make a joke about not getting married young, but even those mar marriages, I'm there to tell you that, those marriages, <laughs> <laughs> led to experiences and opportunities that led to wonderful experiences in my life. It's so hard to say. Again, I, I, I think I, I, I know more on reflection that I would give the advice to myself that I just gave you. Keep learning. Keep looking for those gaps of opportunity. Uh, I would tell you, and again, I think this is a part of my own personality anyway, be kind to others, even when it's difficult. They may be having a difficult day, and if you can give them that one bit of forgiveness, they may be your ally in, in another future endeavor. I found that to be the case, too. Ken, thank you for sharing this Tuesday morning with us. Uh, we're grateful for you sharing the trials, tribulations of both entrepreneurial and your other careers. I will circle back with you, but I definitely will see you Thursday at our Toastmasters meeting. So let's give Ken a big round of applause and we do this through sign language. So Ken, thank you again. 
catch up with you soon. Thank you guys. I enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure. I, um, I, I think the, the other thing I could tell you is don't be embarrassed by your failures because they're a learning lesson for yourself and in my case for you as well. So <laughs> enjoy my failures because I eventually did as well. Cool. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. So you're welcome to